This week on the Eldritch Lawcast, we have Logan from Runesmith dropping by to talk all things Twisted Taverns, Passive Perception, and the Alignment Chart. All that and more coming up right now. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of the Eldritch Lawcast, your new favourite Dungeons and Dragons podcast or, or tabletop RPGs in general. We do talk a lot of D&D on this podcast though. Why wouldn't you? It's the most popular role-playing game in the world. I'm here with Dale Kingsmill, James Hake and Logan from Runesmith uh, filling in today for Sean Merwin who's still coming back from GameholeCon. Logan, what alignment do you think you are if we were to get to know you? Oh, chaotic good. Easy. <laughs> what makes I'm out you for chaotic everyone good? else and I don't know what I'm going to do. I might hit people with a stick just for my friends. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Come enough. out swinging. <laughs> uh, Dale, what about you? You, uh, I hope you don't mind me saying, Dale, you strike me as chaotic good as well. Is that fair? Is that how you Thank see yourself? Thank you so much for saying that. That's the sweetest thing. Um, yeah, I think by traditional measures, I, I would be probably on the border between chaotic good and neutral good. Somewhere around there. There really isn't. A, yeah, there, there needs yourself, to be a middle I ground. See. Yeah. <laughs> uh, James Hake, uh, alignment. Uh, what's your guess, first of all? I think you would probably be neutral. Lawful good. evil. I think you're, I think, yes. You know, <laughs> yes, you got it in one. I think I'm on, I think I'm on kind of the lawful side of neutral good. I am a, I'm a habitual, uh, rule maker and, uh, uh, recovering rule follower. Right. Yeah, no, that, that, that I think I had that That's too. Fine. That's pretty close. Half a step back towards, uh, towards lawful because i think as creators i think it's fair to say we're all creators here there, there's that element of chaos in there for each of us um on today's episode we're all meeting in a tavern uh because i wanted to start by talking about you know the typical way that you might start an adventure if you're playing DD or even if you're playing another fantasy role-playing game uh typically adventures you know there's that whole trope of we start in a tavern and i you know recently there's been a bit of a well probably not recently but there, there's always like the argument against it you know people going oh, i don't want to start in a tavern tavern's boring but the tavern can be interesting dale do you start in tavern is that where you start your adventures in taverns when I'm running, I, I don't think I have started in a tavern yet, which is terrible of me. It, it means I've fallen for this thing. I feel like when I got into the hobby, it was already sort of the punchline of a joke. It was a bit of a, a sort of, it was yeah. deemed the lazy cliche by the time I started. But just now for the first time, I've gotten to play at a game that started in a tavern and what a thrill it was. Uh, I, I feel like taverns are, taverns are <laughs> undervalued and I've been contributing to that. Uh, what's was it an interesting tavern like what's so undervalued about them it, it was just a tavern it was it was it was called the dancing goblin and it had a little it had like a jack-in-the-box goblin game that would pop up and you could put money in and if you hit the goblin with a, a dart or a dagger or something then you get the money in the pot if you miss you don't get any money like that awesome. was it that was the entire setup of the tavern there was nothing there was nothing particularly dramatic about it but it was just it was just kind of nice. It's like you are a bunch of adventurers, you don't know each other. You're all weirdos in this city and you're sitting at a table together and suddenly you're thrown in when this jerk picks a fight with you. You know? And and suddenly sure. you form that bond and and you're you're part of a group together. I I think the taverns have this sort of special quality where they allow the players and their characters to merge just for a minute because at the same time as you are a bunch of of friends who are, you know, escaping the daily drudgery of your life to sit around a table and have fun with good company. Your your characters are taking a break from their adventuring and their hardened lives to just sit around a table with good company. You know, you, you become one and the same. And I think there's something a little bit special about that. Yeah, I think I'm a bit of a tavern apologist as well. Um, I think, I mean, they're, they're easy because, you know, it's a public space where play or characters would theoretically be um, very easily. So it's just a, it's, Look, it is easy, even if it's a cliche, even if it's quote unquote lazy to start in a tavern, it's a great way to start an adventure because it just makes so much sense. But um, I love I love your tavern's name because I find that uh, a lot of DMs, I have a mate who loves to come up with all sorts of puns for his uh, tavern names. The most clever one I ever came up with was the Barefaced Liar. 
L-Y-R-E, and it was like a performing arts kind of tavern where there was a bard school next door and they would, they'd all come across and one player one time was like, oh, great, we're listening to like all the student uh, artists. <laughs> this is, this is going to be terrible. Theatre uh, bar, it's a classic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. James, are you a tavern apologist or do you like to, to, to buck the trend as you're known for doing? Uh, I think the what I want to say first is I think you have a great potential for a double pun in your barefaced liar by having a werebear be the owner and operator of the establishment. Barefaced. <laughs> I knew exactly what you were going to say as soon as you said that. <laughs> um, anyway, to your actual question, um, I I like taverns a lot. Um, they're they're a useful tool. Uh, I've started one or two, one or two of my campaigns in it, but uh, more often than not, my characters wind up finding a tavern as their base of operations uh, mm -hmm. for a long time or even just for a short time throughout their adventures. I mean, I, I like that idea so much, I put it in Dragon Heist. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's where you wind up as your HQ by my intentional. Yeah. Um, it's happening right now in my current campaign. Uh, my current campaign, the characters are based in you know in their home on an island a central island but right now because they're in a uh, a continent or sorry in a country that they're not home to they've managed to find a tavern in the capital city and uh, their adventures for the last oh four or five sessions i think have been based out of that one location it's just mm -hmm. a good place to come back to yeah, I agree. I, I had a campaign that the one of the characters started as the owner of the tavern, and then ah. they upset some uh, local ruffians within the city. And to get back at the the party, the ruffians went and burnt the tavern down as kind of like sending a message, you know. So Ooh. we played that campaign, and it was intended that we would, you know, play until you never end that that sort of thing, where we played for maybe a year or so, and they completed a main story arc. Uh, for a nobleman who awarded them by giving them money and property. So he gave them another tavern and they opened another tavern. And we kind of all came to the realization that that's the end of the campaign. Like they've achieved their goal. Their tavern was burned down. Now they have their tavern back. And it felt like the end of Cheers or something, you know, like a slow uh, a zoom out from them going back to the same vignette we started on of them all drinking uh, in the tavern owned That's by this beautiful. one character. That's a beautiful story. Really cool. Oh, thank you. That's a great um, reminder that D&D campaigns don't have to be uh, epic multi-year yeah. affairs, right? A D&D story can be very self-contained. Well, I think a tavern's a good... An episode uh, of Friends. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think a tavern's a good like. Or cheers, um, I guess would be. Uh, uh, it's a good place for a party to call home, like you were saying, James. If they're not yet like level eight, nine, ten, like if your party want to start having a stronghold or or something like that, then a tavern's maybe a good mid tier uh, place for for them to. Yeah, well, to I own. mean, it's it's also a great opportunity. I think it's like the secret weapon of a DM, right? Because mm. instead of having to lore dump all this information onto your players at random times, you have this brilliant opportunity where you can fill the tavern with NPCs who become personifications of your game's, you know, ideologies and yeah. struggles and conflicts, the different factions that are in your game. They can, everyone comes to a tavern is something that Matt Colville once said. The whole world comes to a tavern and it's and, true. It, yeah, it's so ironically. Helpful. The, the uh, similar angle to that is that with a lot of other locations, the DM is in charge. They know where the party's going, what they have to do, who they have to interact with, and the party knows they have to do something. Mm -hmm. But when they go to a tavern, the responsibility is immediately gone. The fact mm -hmm. that you're in a tavern means you don't have to do anything, which means you can do whatever you want. And I think that's the, the exceptionally fun freedom that comes with going into these these peaceful, passive locations. Mm. So go ahead, go ahead. I, I think all all of us had a very similar thought kind of all at once about the, the, the tavern is a public house, right? The pub's the public house. And and that opens up a lot of opportunities for characters because it doesn't put, like you said, a lot of expectations on them and everyone comes to the tavern. A really, really strong example in media of a tavern being a starting location for quest givers or even a home base is in Leverage, which is a, which is a, a television show about... Uh, good guy criminals doing heists on uh, the rich and terrible, uh, usually at the behest of someone who I has like been screwed over 
by this rich jerk bag. And uh, in the third season of the show, uh, their base of operations is in the upstairs of an Irish pub in Boston that the main character kind of knew from childhood. And so they have their sort of super spy techno lair up on the second floor, but down uh, in the actual pub is where a lot of cool scenes happen. Usually it's their, uh, their patron, their, their quest giver essentially comes and tells their sad story. And it's like, oh, please, won't you help me? Um, but also, you know, there are plenty of times when a bunch of toughs come into the, the pub and they have to deal with them or get roughed up, or there's an intense sort of scene over the pool table where they have to interrogate a guy to get information out of him while kind of slyly doing it over the course of the game. Uh, if you if you watch season three of Leverage, uh, I will say you'll get a lot of good ideas as how to make a tavern a really cool and malleable recurring location in your game. Mm. That's that's cool. I like the the point that you brought up about how um, the overarching plot can also be mixed with just these petty moments where it brings the players back down to earth. It's like oh we're on this like world shattering quest, but this guy is still messing with a friend of mine just because he's drunk. Like the full scale of the world just comes together at a tavern. It's cool. Uh, Logan, you are no stranger to taverns as locations because they can serve as more than just uh, the place where the party start the adventure, as we've already been touching on. But you've written a book mm -hmm. called The Seeker's Guide to Twisted Taverns, which the PDF is currently available uh, through ghostfiregaming.com. Uh, do you want it to is. talk to us a little bit about that? I, I think for me personally... It works real like the as soon as I started flicking through it, I was like, Bard pub crawl. Like the campaign that people talk about all the time, a party of bards yeah. that do a pub crawl. I'm like, Twisted Taverns mm -hmm. is the book for that. And that's kind of ironic because the lead character is very bard like, and you also have uh, two or three taverns that actually can connect all the others together. So you right. can canonically go through all of them either by riding a train, jumping through dimensions, <laughs> or taking this weird like boat. Um, but it was funny. Those I are the three types of D&D campaigns, I... I'm pretty sure. Train, <laughs> jumping through dimensions, yep. weird boat. <laughs> or boat. Yeah, that's it. That's all you can do. <laughs> There's seven story types, three settings. <laughs> um, no, but i wanted to jump back because i actually don't start in taverns a lot okay. i found obviously there's the generic like you have taverns and then equally if you want a different tone for your campaign you start in a prison it's the same setting anyone from any walk of life can be there everyone has to work together to escape and then suddenly you all it's like a gift economy thing you all feel indebted to each other because oh you helped me back then escape now what do we do together yeah that was my but most I recent actually, campaign mine was uh was escaping yeah. during a prison transfer and now they're all fugitives so they can't leave each other <laughs> that's good <laughs> they were chained um, together think, for a while too that's awesome yeah same thing happens in um out of the abyss and i think every one of the elder scrolls games if not a lot of them um but I actually like to, uh, once I get my players' characters like understood their place in the world, I space them throughout a city and I try and make a situation where they have to come together entirely by convenience. Because that's a narrative rule, actually. You can never uh, conveniently cause people to escape situations. You conveniently cause bad things to happen to them. So if you have a player running through like a marketplace who's a thief, they're going to bump into another one of the players mm. and then there's going to be some confusion and it goes from there. So everyone, you get a chance to kind of explore the characters, who they are in their daily lives and uh, suddenly they're pulled out of them by whatever situation you, you kind of present based on who they are. I think that's probably the most fun, but obviously one of the more difficult routes to take. Prisons yeah, that, and taverns are easier. I, I started my first campaign that I ran... Pro I can't remember what my frame of mind was at the time, but I might have been thinking like, oh, taverns are boring. I'm going to start somewhere else. Um, uh, and mm. so it was like, all right, here's the town. Here's the city. Here's like seven locations. One of them was a tavern. Uh, so sue me. Uh, one of them was like the market square. One of them was the chapel. <laughs> one of them was, um, you know, the barracks, you know, whatever it happens to be. And start uh, ask each player character, like, where do you think you are on this particular day when you start? And the That's cleric cool. was in the chapel and he was praying. And so I was like, all right, well, the priest has a quest for you. He's like, oh, holy cleric. The I've done that a few times. The challenge is, like you mentioned, is juggling the players and bringing them all together, ensuring in that first session that everybody gets a chance to play, that the, that one scene isn't yeah. kind of going for too long. Um, and then 
kind of getting them into into Cause... one space and then it feels like the ball starts to roll yeah, I think a big part of putting a party together is either some of them have to feel indebted to other players or they have to feel like there's a promise with continuing with these these other characters. So when you can balance those two based on each character's priorities, like if you have some more selfish characters, they want something. If you have some more apologetic or good-natured characters, they're going to kind of be on the downside and then you have someone else bring them out. And then it's like, oh, I'm following you. Mm. Um, so that that's fun to explore, but... You had an earlier question that I tangented for 20 minutes. <laughs> That's okay. Something about Hasn't taverns? Been, something about a book had, I wrote? Yeah, yeah. Something. Oh, was there a book that you wrote? Uh, yeah, The Seeker's Guide to, to Twisted Taverns, which, um, as, I, right. as I said, I liked the idea of, of the barred pub crawl. But the other uh, kind of cool thing about it is, you know, you, you can take these taverns. If you want to start a campaign in a tavern, you can use one of the taverns from the book and the party might almost immediately leave yeah. or they might not, but you've still got something that's a little bit, you know, out of the box for them to yeah. engage with. And none of them are very standard. A couple of them seem kind of standard. You have like the basic, oh, this one's seedy. This one's like kind of cheap. This one's like in a decommissioned boat. Mm. But yeah, as you said, the, the party can leave. And not explore the secrets, and that's fine because there's still like rooms, there's still characters they can meet, they can show up later, mm. or they can stay and explore the location. And kind of one of the main things that I made these taverns for is if, uh, because I deal with it all the time, almost every single week, every time I try to do a live game, someone can't join. And right. you don't want to like push the, the adventure forward, so why not stop by a tavern, see what's going on here. And like you said, there's no obligation, so the party can explore... These little side quests, things that NPCs want them to do, or they can figure out the deep lore of the location and have a full like mini adventure and yeah, sure. resolve like dramatically changing almost every single location as they do so. Mm. Is Morgan, this... I've got a question for you about the tavern. Sorry, Ben, you might have no, 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 you in? go. No, no, no please. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the idea of taverns that have hidden secrets is really really compelling to me, and as a sort of seasoned DM. I I mm -hmm. first think of my players who are, you know, n not untested either, going to a tavern that seems like your classic run-of-the-mill place and mm -hmm. being very sort of goal-oriented, right? It, it doesn't seem yeah. special on the surface. So there is probably a fair assumption. It's like, oh, well, this is just a tavern that James didn't put very much effort into this week. Uh, so yeah. we're, we're not going to, you know, kind of scratch at the peeling wallpaper because that would just be embarrassing for everyone involved. Now we're just going to kind of get straight to the point. Exactly. If you had a tavern yeah. that had a hidden secret, but otherwise quite unassuming, and your players were kind of in this mindset, what would you recommend to actually kind of clue them in subtly? to that there's something bigger going on um if you have like a fully planned hidden nature then you can definitely like if if you've got a good grasp on what's really going on here you can creatively bring in these concepts and be like oh well i know that there's like an ooze that can, is controlling this place so if they were to scratch at the wallpaper maybe they find some weird film like just thematic notes that you can put um i think one of the most uh, interesting and important taverns that's actually in the book that plays a hundred percent onto that is my favorite tavern. It's called uh, Poor Larry's, and Poor Larry's is the crappiest tavern that the party can go to. It has nothing in it. It's it, like decrepit. It's molding on the walls. A lot of the rooms are decommissioned, and there's one guy that works there. He can't do anything right. Like, it feels like I wrote it as a joke at first. It should feel like that to the party as like, oh, this guy trips over a bunch of buckets. Like, all of his food is moldy. His meals are bland. The bedrooms look like he just slept in one of them because he doesn't have a real house. And um, if you approach him and you talk to him, you're like, hey, what's that room or what's this room? He'll talk to you. And after a certain amount of time, he'll be like, look, I need help. This place is falling apart and it's not my fault. And you eventually learn that there's actually this deep, uh, so you can, it's it's funny, you go step by step, like, oh, the bathroom uh, is like one of them's clogged, the other one doesn't work, like the door's broken. If you go in and fix it, something nightmarish, like Eldritch happens there at the, to the first room and then any following rooms. They're like, oh, we cleaned the toilet 
And now whenever you sit on the toilet, you have to make like a, a wisdom save or you get off the toilet. Like you're too afraid to poop. Oh, I'm, like so, you I'm so glad why. you said wisdom save. Of all the saves you could have mentioned, <laughs> yeah, I'm and, glad it was wisdom that you said. Dexterity save. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, no, but eventually you find that he... Um, and my favorite part about this tavern, absolute favorite, is actually the art. In the front of it, um, it's Larry's. And the, t- the sign's kind of faded, and there are vines growing over it. But if you zoom in, it, another note that I really liked is that there's a black cat walking in front of the front door. But um, if you zoom in on the sign, there are letters removed from it that says, A Lucky Larry and Sons. And if you ask him about that, you'll find that he had three sons and has one daughter. All of them met terrible ends and are all still alive. One's in prison, one is a failed bard, the other is a chef working at a rival tavern. You learn that his wife died tragically, and you learn that in order to support these kids that are all now gone, he made a pact with an eldritch being to keep the tavern alive forever. Now that they're all gone, he has to keep the tavern alive forever and can't support anyone. So you go through this... (laughs) And at the very end of it, you fight this like challenge rating 20 eldritch being just for the sake of this. He's a literal commoner, just for the sake of a commoner. Now we're talking. I love everything about that. My favorite one. I um, In order to get uh, players engaged in secrets in my town, I don't think any of my secrets are quite that level of uh, of detailed and like plot spanning. That That's incredible. Yeah. Um, I did, however, recently run. Um, I had a, a seemingly normal tavern, uh, but I really needed to hook my players into sort of the next town that they were heading to and so i had um sort of a a kidnapped rich kid who was tied up in the back room i really wanted my players to notice that something was up and i had two things going for me one was passive perception oh thank goodness for passive perception isn't that the best the door swings open and someone catches a glimpse of this guy in the back room the other thing was uh sometimes it can ruin it sometimes it can i'm i'm really i'm really (laughs) choosy with my passive i'm always like like yeah if if you want them to notice something you're going to use passive perception. If you don't want them to notice something without trying, it's like, why is this still yeah. here? <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. I absolutely take advantage of the, uh, of the passive perception loopholes. I go today it's passive. Um, and I'll lower, I'll lower the, uh, the, the DC needed as well. Um, just to be on the safe side. But the other thing I had going for me was that one of my players, uh, has a custom background feature which we call Barbrat because she grew up in a tavern around all these sort of seedy types. And so I gave her this feature that just oh. means that when she's in a tavern, she kind of can get a read on if anyone in, in sort of amongst the patrons is dangerous or, mm. you, know, you know, who who you can sort of easily make money from if you, you know, challenge them to a, to a, a game. Oh. If you, if you can, you the know, chumps. those sorts of things. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. She she just kind of gets a nice little read on all of the patrons in a in a different tavern, and that's come up multiple times. That's really really handy. Just anytime they stop off at a tavern, cool. and I want them to get hooked onto an adventure, I'm like, well, you notice. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I I agree that the passive perception is um. There's like a a, a a a double standard there in terms of like, you know, well, I don't want them to just notice this trap door. So if they say they're looking for trap doors, I'll let them notice it with their passive. But similar to you, Dale, if there's yeah. something going on in a tavern or something like that, I'll just pick the player that has the highest passive perception, even if it's like 11 or 12 and be like, yeah. you notice mm-hmm. this like special thing that nobody else Absolutely. does. I think, this is uh, so funny. I did not expect myself to be the uh, the completely unabashed passive perception liker in this group. <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I like love it. it. When, I, think, I love it when my players okay. notice things. Let them notice everything. Let I them find the trap. The main, it's the, so much more fun. Yeah, right? the main they know problem, the trap is there. And have, yeah, go ahead. It depends. Because like, um, if I if I especially as like writing books, let's say I make a room. I put a door here and I put a trap door there. If people notice it with a passive perception of 14 and that's a standard at like level one, Mm. I didn't put a trap door there. That's Mm. just a door Mm. that they notice. Mm. So there's no narrative purpose that it serves. Especially because a lot of I, I, this might I disagree be a completely. My, I disagree completely. You, 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 you can set you can set the perception. 
you, you can see right? if, if you really don't want him to notice that you you know the averages right if you're if you're doing some game design uh and every dm is a game designer yeah. in some way or shape or form right if you yes. if you know your party or you at least know the averages of the typical group if you're writing a pre-published thing then you can and you're putting a trap door there you can yeah, okay, you can simply cool. leave it higher than their passive perception allows for but also i I truly believe that if they notice the trap door, uh, that's that's still good storytelling, right? It, it gives them agency when they notice things and can interact with them. Um, you know, not not all railroading is a sin. I, I believe this too. Sometimes having them just wander no, onto a trap door because yeah. you know because your adventure takes place five thousand feet underground. If they just wander into a trap door and they fall down there, well. Sometimes they, they got to commit to the story. Sometimes you got to commit to just throwing them into a situation. Yeah. Um, but then you make, you know, you make it impossible. Then you have DC 30, right? You, you, you don't give them a choice. Uh, mm. I, I love passive perception. And I think that, uh, uh, okay. I, it, it, it takes, it, it takes some understanding. It takes some work, like but that. yeah, that's the problem that I've seen in a lot of places is that, um, if you have something that players can roll for that that gives them a sense of oh i might be able to accomplish this mm. and if you set the dc really high i've had a lot of players it might just be the way that like the parties that i've had go but if they realize or if they eventually find out that like oh that was an unbeatable dc it's like why did we even roll that mm. that felt like a waste of time but for things like trap doors or traps they're still they still like inherently and fundamentally they have to have a dc to be noticed but if they're so well hidden that a party can't notice them it's this funny little catch 22 of like do i let them figure it out do i not even tell them about it because i don't know I'm, i might work with just really grumpy parties but i feel like they would be upset either way <laughs> I, well, I think... maybe this is where like investigation can come in over perception. You don't allow the passive perception to discover the trap door because it's covered by a carpet. There's no or whatever it happens to be, right? There's no way to just look at it and notice. Or yeah. you might argue that like, well, they'd notice maybe something like a, a crease in the carpet or something, but unless they're intelligent yeah. enough in quotation marks I'm... to figure out that there's I a trapdoor could... there. I think that's a really cool idea, but yeah. That is a really cool idea. No, I was just going to say I could play devil's advocate and say like, well, how many rolls is too many rolls for one trap door? Because you could have like the, oh, do we notice it? Do we figure out what it is? Do we disarm it? And then I feel like um, it's the same thing with web design. If you can't get somewhere in two or three clicks, then it no one's going to go there. Well, so I it's guess the same thing for certain encounters. It's like how 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 far do you go until it gets tedious? But well, I guess what I would say is that like it's just one roll. It's just an investigation check. If they say I search the room, I look for trap. Oh, doors. so you're basing it on the passive. Okay, I like that. Yeah, yeah, that's, exactly. that's a good that's a good resolution to that. Yeah. The, the well, other thing that I'm not I saying like I'm in the right. Is, um... This is my perspective. Yeah. No, I mean we're <laughs> we're, 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 we're all just, we're all just talking about good. what we're saying. Yeah. It's good. We're getting friction. It's it's drama for the podcast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I I think it's also handy. One of the things that I like doing. So with that example, you know, your passive perception, you notice the guy tied up in the back room. I, yeah. It was a little more complicated than that. It still left them with choices because I had made sure that the party really liked the the tavern patron first, like a uh, mm. patron. Um, the, the guy the who person. was tied up. The person, no, the person who owned the tavern, the woman who owned the tavern, who was running this oh. place, they loved her. That she was their best friend. They fully conflict, adopted her. Yeah. And then they noticed this guy tied up in the back room. So then you have this thing of like, do we talk to her? Because we really like her. <laughs> well, like, what is this situation? Yeah. Maybe he's a bad guy. Do we just investigate? <laughs> do we try to go back there? Do we try to sneak back there? Do we okay. talk to the people who are guarding the door? You know, you've got all these things. And and maybe you can do something like that with trapdoors as well. You know, you, you put them in a situation where it's like, Okay, we weren't expecting a trapdoor, so do yeah, we? So I, I do really we like that. Be led by our curiosity at this point. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's not just statistical; it's also moral. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, now that we know this thing is it exists, what does that mean to us? Mm. And I think if you have more of kind of a cross conflict there, I think it's a lot more fun, a lot more complex. I think our difference of opinion that. that we've been having over this particular game mechanic is really indicative of a large truth about uh, fifth edition, which is that uh, mm -hmm. it's a big tent. Um, mm -hmm. a, yeah. a lot of mechanics that work perfectly for me, for example, aren't exactly a perfect fit for another group. Yeah. Um, and 
uh, one one might call that a failing of the system, but mm -hmm. I, I personally see it as a strength. Yeah, me too. Uh, because you know, we've talked about this on the podcast before, but D and D kind of by it by its nature, by its size and its popularity, has to be a lot of things for a lot of people, and it really wants to be a strong it's middle nothing. ground. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's got to be a yeah. strong middle ground it's, so that people it's, can it's take a, what they like. It's a functional tool. That it, it's a pencil. <laughs> and I, I really like, uh, like I've said before, City of Mist is a lot of fun. But yeah, it essentially functions as a pencil. And I like doing a really dumbed down version of another narrative game, City of Mist, where you just roll 2d6. And then you have uh, bonus modifiers based on the situation, what you can do, what you're trying to do. And then there's just uh, collective successes or failures. But D&D, &D obviously, um, it's interesting because I've had some conflicting talks about Tasha's with other people. Where D&D, uh, &D, especially with the DM's guide and the play, more so the DM's guide than the player's guide. It's like, look, this game, we're trying to tell you what it is, but we also want you to know it's whatever you want it to be. Yeah. And Tasha's really hammered that in very kind of ham-fistedly. It was like, okay, look, maybe you didn't get the notice in the past books. You can do what you want. And I feel like that's what D&D &D is. And um, a lot of the conflicts that come from certain mechanics and systems is just people like, oh, well, this is what I thought it was, or this is what I thought it was. And they're all right in their own, in their own right. Mm. It's just a matter of um, interpretation, I think. It's, it's kind of a hard topic to juggle because on one hand, yes, D&D &D is whatever you want it to be. But on the other hand, it is also a set of rules that have been published and you know especially if you're playing say Play adventures testing. league organized play where the rules have to kind of yeah. be the unifying arbiter uh people you know people really want something strong out of those rules they paid 150 bucks for just the core they want the rules to be real good mm. yeah um so you know it's, it's a balancing true. act D D is a pencil is my favorite wisdom i'm gonna take <laughs> that i'm gonna keep it Thank you. i'm gonna pretend that it was mine keep it <laughs> <laughs> Write it down. You can have it. Well, speaking of things that we might uh, disagree on, we got an email in uh, this week, and I'll, I'll quickly read the email out. Um, uh, but I actually think there's a larger discussion to be had than what uh, Jeremy, who sent in the email, um, necessarily asked about. So quickly reading those out, uh, or that out. Uh, Hi, Lawcasters. Loving the podcast so far and all the different opinions that are discussed each week. With the discussion recently around alignment and codifying of some creatures as typically evil and typically good, which is a change that's uh, coming to, to new monster stat blocks, or already is in uh, Witchlight. Um, anyway, uh, I was wondering if there was any interest uh, or any interesting ways you would make adventures around traditionally good aligned villains or traditionally evil aligned creatures... Uh, making those heroic. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts and thanks for such a great show. Jeremy, um, uh, if that made sense as I tried to sight read that, um, you know, could you make an adventure with a, an antagonist who is the good aligned, uh, you know, maybe there's a, an arc, an, a, a Seraph. Yes. Um, Just yeah. <laughs> in case anyone disagrees with me. <laughs> oh, we're, we're getting that serious now. Jeez, okay. <laughs> yeah. Alignment is serious business, Ben. You well, should have I, known before you brought this topic to the table. There will be blood to pay. Jeremy! The most controversial. <laughs> well, mechanic. I just thought uh, I would ask first, like before, like because uh, you know I agree. You can you can do a villain who is a traditionally good aligned uh, character, and they mm -hmm. may even be good aligned in the campaign. But alignment to me is always an interesting topic to discuss largely because I don't like to treat it like a strict mechanic, even though I like no. part of when it does come into the game as a strict mechanic through like a magic item or something. Um, yeah. Throwing it out, uh, Logan, like how do you use alignment in your games? Do you use alignment in your games? I, I know it's a bit derivative of the question and it's definitely going to be a very non-answer to where the question's going. I would like sure. to... Uh, entertain it and see where we can get with it because I think there are really fun ways to explore that but I don't think alignment is something that a creature can be I think alignment can only be applied to the action of a character during a moment you can make an evil action you can make a chaotic action it doesn't define you there is no such thing as an evil character because for the most part evil characters have their family and their friends and they're not evil to them 
generally. There obviously are some very narcissistic villains that you can play with. They're a little cliche in my opinion, but I think that uh, for the most part, everyone is looking out for themselves and their friends. And they can make mistakes in doing that. They can obviously make very evil, very good, intentional or unintentional or very neutral decisions that can lead to good or negative consequences. I don't think it's definitive of a character. I, don't, I think when your alignment changes mechanically like for the next hour you can really only do like good things or something i feel like it's not um a definition of a character right i i i have a, a similar viewpoint i think i think that alignment is better categorized in terms of actions than in terms of yeah. uh personality in insofar as i think alignment should be descriptive rather than prescriptive it's a sort of nature versus yeah, nature like thing that. almost right it's like you're you're not chaotic evil because you have chaos and evil in your soul unless you're a demon where you're literally made out of chaos and evil and that's all yeah, like, that's the fabric yeah. of your thing um <laughs> i like that but uh but you know if you do evil for long enough i think people would be justified in calling you an evil person right you consistently yes. do evil it, it becomes a trait You're, associated with you. I do like that. It's that your actions build a portfolio of who uh, you really are. Mm -hmm. I think that's true about mm -hmm. just about anyone in general. Mm -hmm. It's like good people can do bad things, things, bad people so, can do good things, yeah. but it's a it's a trend. It's a trend we have to look at. Yeah. Yes. And I do I do like the really interesting Taoist perspective of if you were to be sitting in a chair at one side of a room, you stood up and you walked to the other side of the room. You are not the person who was sitting in that chair a few seconds ago. You're the person standing on the other side of the room. So you're never the same person, like, because the time is never the same. You're always changing, always adapting. Like, people are rapidly changing all the time. So I think to look back at a, a history of someone's actions and then judge them and be like, oh, are you collectively evil? Have you caused a lot of destruction or have you brought life? like collectively around you in the long run or the short run. A lot of people, that's the dispute, I think, is if you're doing things immediately or if the ends justify the means. And that's what makes mm. a lot of villains. Because, I mean, but you have I to think, ask the good place question, right? What is yeah, exactly. good? <laughs> what, what, how do we define that? Is it, is it the thing that has the good consequence? Is it the thing yeah. that is good for and this good. person immediately? Is it the thing yeah. that's good for the most people? You, trolley mm -hmm. questions abound. <laughs> it's extremely, um, it's a personal question that everyone has to kind of find the answer for themselves. And I feel like a lot of villains, even in when they are evil, unless they're fundamentally like a, a collective psychological aspect of what lawful evil is, like Asmodeus, <laughs> it's, it's a matter of um, what are you trying to do? Who are you trying to be? And what has that caused? I feel like that's what makes a character. Hmm. I uh, I think you're right in terms, Dale, of what you were saying about the interpretation of good and evil and chaotic, chaos and, and neutrality good. and lawfulness, especially because chaotic as an alignment is often interpreted as like, I throw rocks and I eat dirt and I like love worms and, you know, I just I do think... whatever I, I think I can think of. Chaotic, I think chaotic is selfish and lawful is communal. Oh, 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 this is interesting because I disagree very strongly yeah. with this. I don't, uh, okay. I don't know if I disagree. I'm so excited. Right, I have so many again. opinions like, about this. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I think, I think that's interesting because alignment is such a, it's a rigid concept. You are aligned. Yeah. To be aligned is to have like defined angles and, and ridges. So I'd, I'd like to hear the discussion on this. That's the end of my can, can I can I, can I just quickly throw out there because this this caught me by surprise and I think really highlights the differing in interpretation of you know chaos versus law versus good versus evil or, or whatever. I, in one mm -hmm. of the first campaigns I ran, um, I uh, it, it was Lost Minds of Fandelva or a version thereof, and they were in Cragmore Castle, and there's a goblin in there that like tries to make a deal with the party. Um, or, or at least the, the game we were playing led to a goblin being like the only one left standing in the room. And he was like, ah, I will tell you what you need to know, but you got to let me go. And the party were like, yep, yeah, totally. Um, so he's like, all right, what you need to do is if you go down the hall, up the stairs, there's the bad guy. You want to kill him. He knows this, blah, blah, blah. And the, the cleric was like, great, perfect. You've been really helpful. Let's shake on a, on a good deal. 
and the player succeeded a deception right. check on me because he uh, mm-hmm. cast. They went for the handshake, and he cast uh, inflict wounds. And I was just like, the goblin just like unpeels and falls into a pile of mush. But the player was like, I am doing a good act. I am destroying no. an <laughs> evil creature. I know. That's what I thought. It shocked the hell exactly, out of me. Exactly. That's what, yeah. <laughs> that is like, an what? evil action for a perceived long-term good consequence. But that's uneducated. It's like goblins are still part of like the whole system of things it's it's interesting so i i I think i'd like to hear james's opinion it seems like you (laughs) i oh god i it's it's long and rambling and and covers a lot of territory i i I, I, I want to start by by sharing a little known fact that uh, i learned from matt colville which is that alignment is really in its origins a prototypical faction system when dnd had a strong wargaming route Mm. you know characters that were chaotic and evil would have teams you know they could align with align with chaotic Mm. and evil creatures um and so you know that's why lizard men who were lawful evil could you know team Uh. up with hobgoblins who were neutral evil because they shared evil in their in their portfolio um and you know there 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 was that factionalism to alignment um Mm. yeah you just added like a fourth dimension of the concept to my brain (laughs) right right that makes sense (laughs) yeah it it makes it so much simpler and also it's it's so much more complicated yeah it's not so much which box do you fit in but who is going to like you and who's going to (laughs) hate you based on Mm -hmm. like who you are what you've done so that's Mm -hmm. cooler that's an interesting perspective on it or development of it i guess um but 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 overall i i think what what i would say about good and evil in particular is you you call you call lawful and chaos selfish versus communal i think that's that's more like what good and evil is to me uh, the evil alignment to me is selfish uh yeah. self-interest over over all others and good mm-hmm. is the the well-being of the people around you self-sacrifice it's a typically it heroic, ironic archetypically heroic trait <laughs> I, I feel like this is more of a tesseract than it is a diagram. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. like a this is this is the moral shadow of something much bigger. So it's like we we think that we know like top and down are different than left and right, but if you're looking at a tesseract, they're not at all. It's like a very top and down, left and right. It. I'm totally on board with this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like um, if if you are working for yourself, it's I, I feel like it's almost to a degree. How much wisdom do you have? Uh, to like personally like do you know the long-term effects and do you know the short-term effects because like Mm. uh, as as a really bad narrative example but it's such a fun story i'm loving it. i'm almost done with it with uh one piece luffy is a character who um is incredibly reckless doesn't think about the next step doesn't think about the big picture ever all he does is punch people he doesn't like and overarching he becomes one of the most morally correct people because we get a bit of his backstory. We realize that at the beginning, he learned what a lot of adults and a lot of villains who have grown up without realizing these lessons, he's learned those lessons. So he has like more maturity than them and he is able to treat everyone like a child, even though he acts like a child. Mm. And there's some strange irony to that, that he, a character like that, who is like the ultimate protagonist, obviously gets a bit pandered to but it's the matter of like what i'm doing no matter what in the long term is for the good i don't care if i'm hurting people or not i don't care if i sock this guy in the face just because i disagree with him because i think i'm right and for people who are a bit more who have a bit of a higher wisdom i think they would be closer to what what the universal long-term right is if there is truly any such thing exactly i feel i feel like when you hit like a wisdom of 20 you realize there is no right you lose the ability to go good or evil you have to be neutral <laughs> um, there is no objective truth i have opinions yeah. and i would like to share them Please i'm sorry i've been share. you could if you I, were a superhero you could have killed me like five times by now i'm here to flip the table <laughs> because uh someone had to say it someone was gonna say it it was inevitable I don't use traditional alignment in my games. And here's why. (laughs) Okay. Because, okay, for starters, get rid of this grid that we've got. I'm using an XY axis that that goes off 
it for infinity in all directions, right? Yeah, because exactly. Because we already saw, when we said at the beginning, James and I both said that we were neutral good, but I leaned more chaotic, James leaned mm. more neutral. There you go. We need to be able to plan ourselves more freely on this, uh, on this particular I'm far diagram. range chaotic. I don't even know yeah. what I'm going to say. <laughs> You're way out <laughs> towards infinity. Um, <laughs> but um, no, the, the other thing is that I've taken to completely swapping the terminology based on the campaign. So instead of saying oh. good, evil, lawful, chaotic, I think about what the important um, sort of uh, conflicts of my, of my story, story, I don't like the word story for campaigns, of the campaign are. So in my case, uh, my, my sort of main campaign at the moment it's um, tradition versus innovation. And I ask my players that. I say, oh. okay, where do you fall on this scale? Do you, do you see yourself yeah. as traditional or innovative in your actions? Um, I and like I, that as a substitute for the real world equivalent. That's so much more <laughs> honest, I think. It, <laughs> Straightforward. It, it just makes it a little bit easier to avoid the kind of... I like it. Of, I love it. Thank you. The, the sort of moral question that's at the basis of it, you can mm. kind of sidestep a little bit because you can choose words that avoid the moralizing. So instead of saying yeah. good and evil, you can say, you know, um, community mm -hmm. or yourself and your friends, right? You can, you can say yeah. things like that. And neither of those seems evil when you pick it. It's just how your character kind of thinks. And, and you end up with this, um, this interesting thing where I'm, I mean, this is, this is, something I picked up from theater school, so maybe James can relate. Yat Laban had, this is weird, had a series of, um, of sort of classifications of movement that deliberately, the thing I'm interested in was that it was like, you know, movements can be quick and light and um, irregular, but none of mm. the terminology used to describe any of these dichotomies of movement, it was never fast and slow. It was quick versus sustained, right? Mm. It's that, that significant choice to not let one have, have dominance or hierarchy or importance over the other. Both are good. Sustained is good. Quick is yeah. good. But you just have to make a choice. And I think that that is super, super useful for alignment and, uh, and particularly uh, for yeah. how players use alignment. Yeah, I also agree that it's like a time and place kind of thing. Like you can be like conservative or in the face of something that is more reserved and like restrained, you should be innovative. So there's there's a scale that you should find the, the middle of. But obviously with opposition with villains, you're going to find either they're way too innovative or way too reserved. Mm -hmm. And th those are really good conflict points. I actually love that concept of a system. And then people who are selfish, way too selfish. And there are people who are way too communal. Yeah, it's the extreme. Like if you're yeah. too communal and not se selfish, you're self-sacrificial. You're going to die. You're a tree beard. You're a green beard. It's not fair. <laughs> tree beard. Yeah. You're going to say. Yeah, um, no, that's a great example. Yeah. I, um, I, I love this that you've presented, Dale, and it's, it's touching yeah. upon something that I'm working on here at Ghostfire that, uh, no uh, one other than my, at present... I'm sorry, my cat just, did you see that? My cat just brought in a bird. <laughs> <laughs> no, it went behind the fish tank. What? <laughs> What is that happening? Is not, that is not the sort of like glitch in recording I was expecting to have. <laughs> if you had told me this morning that Logan's cat would bring in a bird, that's not what I thought. We were just talking about chaos, that cat. <laughs> it's funny because the one who's normally chaotic is feeling really like tired right now. And then she goes out. I don't see her. I can't pet her. She Alignment has... isn't what you are, it's what Just you do. Just to show, yeah. <laughs> Perfect example. <laughs> oh my god, oh, what? Geez. Do you do you need to deal with that? Do you need do to go to catch handle bird? something? No, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it on, I'll get a glove and see if I can grab it. Uh, where, what were where, we where talking about? <laughs> I think you were saying uh, something, James. <laughs> yes, I was talking about, Dale, you mentioned something that reminded me of something that I'm working on behind the scenes of ghost fire that so far, you secret, know, secret. single digit number of numbers of people know about. Um, and I'm making the executive decision that I can talk about it a little bit here. And it's one of the future of the adventures that I'm working on, uh, working on is called reputation and That's alignment me too. Alignment tries to make objective decisions, objective statements about actions that can be interpreted in many ways. Reputation 
is what people think about you, how other people interpret your actions and what broadly speaking the, uh, the course of your legend becomes. Uh, throughout the campaign, as you do a variety of things, this is a campaign that may not, that is about people who can you know run the gamut of of alignments and you know courses of action, and I I have no interest in ascribing alignment to them. I mean, here's here's my dream secret. I've been talking this whole time. I don't use alignment in my home games. I don't care about it. I, I would rather they just kind of do it. Alignment Either. I think is a good tool, a good crutch, a good a good starting yeah. point. I think it's to, funny. We, obviously, the fact that we don't use it means that we have very developed opinions of it. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and and I, I think it'd be very cool to run a very sort of like uh, old school game with magic that affects alignment and impacts is based off your alignment. And like the alignment changes every uh, every session based on the stuff you did and stuff like that. But I, overwhelming. I'm I'm very I know very overwhelming. You have to commit to it. But I'm interested in in not not what the universe thinks of your alignment. I'm much more interested in what other people think of you. Mm. That's that's actually really interesting. Um, so in the current world setting that I'm working on, I've, I've been working with a couple of Hawaiian consultants, and I've been looking into a lot of general like Polynesian, also Norse uh, themes, mythology like concepts, and surprisingly. Polynesian uh, religious views are very similar to Hinduist. And like you were saying, it's interesting that, um, what is it? Not, not karma or karuma, it's uh, mana. They have mana, or I guess that's a Spanish pronunciation. It might've, I don't, I don't know the pronunciation in Hawaiian, but essentially mana is not just a magical manifestation of what you can do. It's your exertion over the world around you in very tangible ways. So if you have a good reputation, like if you are a good person, you've done good things, people have seen what you've done, they are your friends. It's sort of like a abstract concept of a gift economy, is if you are going around helping everyone around you, then that you have this, this influence over the people around you because they care about you, because you care about them. So you're, you're exerting your force over your local environment and that is kind of the magic that you generate. It's like if you go into your garden and plant like a bunch of garden plants, that's going to be food that you generate. That is a form of your manifested will, sort of. It's like, mm -hmm. I'm going to plant these. The fact that they exist is an exertion of your will over the world. So it's interesting that in the same sense, your reputation for the most part is how other people see what you've done. So mm -hmm. they're very similar concepts, maybe not systems. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I want to say yeah, something, but I feel like like I have nothing to say. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, man, this is all so interesting. Ben, but what like, do you think about alignment? Yeah, what do you, do you think? use alignment oh, in your I, games? I, I I use it like you said before, Joey, like descriptive rather than prescriptive. The idea is that you know alignment can be used to loosely describe the general behaviors of a person, but it's a not, judgment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but the but you know you quickly learn, and I think what I'm learning from this conversation is like you know everybody has different interpretations of what good or evil or chaotic or neutral means, yeah. and I think a lot of the conversations we've been having here are very useful in creating new language to help me and hopefully some other people listening describe or put um, some effect to uh, you know describing good in different ways if that makes sense. Like both actions are by some definition good, but you know, good for different yeah. people or good in different ways or whatever. Yeah. The one like more simplistic way of looking at alignment that I do enjoy in the rules and it comes up in fifth edition pretty rarely, but it does come up from time to time is like a magic weapon that can only be wielded by a good aligned character. Or I think the Rakshasa in its stat block in the monster manual specifically says that it is, weak to piercing damage dealt by a good aligned character. Um, I think that though through this conversation, you look at Thor as being the only one worthy to lift Mjolnir. Well, what yeah. like is Mjolnir like making a judgment call on why Thor is worthy? Like obviously it's more than just good or evil. And maybe so as a, that's, as a, that's as funny. a game master, you can decide, yeah. sorry, just to finish the thought as a game master, mm. you can decide like, all right, well, instead of ascribing a strict good alignment to this magic item, 
the player has to, and you discuss this with the player, you don't keep it as a secret, um, you know, like gotcha thing that, oh, suddenly this weapon yeah. stops working, but you discuss, all right, what actions will contribute to you being able to wield the weapon and what actions may contribute to you not being able to wield it anymore because of, you know, whatever reason, whether it's magic yeah, or some so deity or... Sorry, Logan, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's interesting. You, you, The way that you described it and the fact that you mentioned Mjolnir is really interesting to me because I feel like that adds a whole new angle to the concept of magic items. Because mm. from my perspective, uh, when Thor couldn't call Mjolnir... It's not because Mjolnir didn't think that he was worthy. It's that Thor thought he wasn't worthy. So he couldn't draw it. It's, that's the reason deep. that Steve does it is because he doesn't care whether or not he's worthy. So he's able to pull it. I think that um, a lot like alignment, it's a matter of your own perspective. In, like in your heart of hearts, aside from all these illusions that you present to other people, all these personas that you give other people, do you think that what you're doing is right? So if you think that what you're doing is good, a good aligned weapon is going to notice that and catch on yeah. to you, whether or not you're a good guy. So I oh. think that this kind of falls back into the question in the email that I think is a really fun idea to explore. Could an insanely like horrific, like Orcus level villain of I want to kill everyone because they're too loud and they hurt each other. It's like, I want to end everything. Is this insane weapon that is good aligned going to help me because it knows what I want is ultimately good? I, I feel like, you know, there's so many fun From things my to play with there. Yeah. Because I think that, like, if you want a genuine, like, you know, an Excalibur-style weapon or something like that, only the right person can pull this out of the stone. If you want, yeah. from the DM's perspective, for that to be, a let's say, virtuous, use the word virtuous weapon, that doesn't mm -hmm. prescribe to evil actions even if the character there is no universal is definition good. of evil it is personal for sure for sure um but could you know you could you could play with something like the you know the weapon becomes corrupted you know maybe this is like a, a mjolnir yeah. or, or something where it starts and like as long as you believe you're doing the right thing but the weapon's appearance like changes over time you know maybe it goes they, from dealing radiant damage to fire damage as as you know cool. more and more evil yeah. acts are uh, evil acts are indulged or upon you know, universally kind of decided yeah. by the dungeon master and the, and the player from more more yeah as um the new mechanic that james was talking about the um your reputation like does the magic change based on other people's perspectives in mm. addition to yours mm. so like do they see fire when you see this holy light mm. um i got a tangent i was going to go on <laughs> <But>. <laughs> It's just, that's a really cool um, concept that like, it's based on yourself. Mm. Uh, I, I want to talk briefly about alignment and mythology because alignment to me is a very mythic concept. It has, it, it feels like, because it's so morally absolute, it feels like it has the startings and sort of human prehistoric storytelling and yeah, definitively when when you boil it down right myths are statements of morality that intend to unite a culture mm, yeah. greek myths talk about you know what is good and evil in ancient greek society and we can extrapolate what we do about what they were like from the stories they told and you can do that for every culture on earth and I think that if you really want to use alignment in your game, you have to make a judgment call on what culture is your alignment from the perspective of. There's a word there that I want people listening to look up that is so applicable to that. It's called zeitgeist. Mm. And some, mm. some writers obviously mm. know it. It's a matter of <laughs> what fits the current situation. Like, I, I feel like a lot of people haven't looked it up. It's not a super common term, I think. It's kind of fallen out by the wayside. It might just be my perspective. But spirit it's a matter of, of like... Spirit of the moment is what it means. German. Yeah, spirit mm. of the moment. So um, it's not a matter of what is right overall, because no one can know that. Like, what is right for us in our current culture is not what is right for a, a, a layman in Rome. It's completely mm. different. It is a spirit of the moment. And the moment is always right now. So it's interesting that it can fully shift and develop based on what the world needs to see at that time. Kind of like the, the, the Batman quote. What is it? 
uh, not what we want, but what we need or something. Uh, it is not, not who we are on the inside, but what we deserve. It's no, us. it's, it's not what Gotham deserves, but what Gotham, oh, what Gotham needs. needs right now. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking yeah, to the Dark Knight expert that's, that's, over here, yeah. That's yeah. kind of a, an alignment thing. Like, he's obviously lawful good. He's not good. Can, can I ask a question, sorry, very quickly, Dale, because I feel mm. like you have a lot to speak into about this because I know that mythology is kind of your jam. <laughs> um, because my what I'm learning more and more through engaging with particularly Greek and Roman mythology, uh, Roman, sorry, I mean to say Norse mythology, Greek and Norse mythology, is that to... M- to what I'm seeing from people who are talking about it now on the internet and, and you know, people doing research and, and discussing it is that Greek mythology and Norse mythology are not necessarily tales of, uh, uh, about what they think is right, not necessarily like morality tales, but just, you know, in Greek mythology, the, the moral lesson seems to be a lot like don't piss off the gods, you know, like I think of the Arachne story. I wonder, I don't know, but I wonder if like the Greeks were like, yeah, no, Arachne did bad or whether it's more like, oh, look, Arachne was a bit of a victim, but don't piss off the gods. Like that's what you shouldn't do. And maybe hedonism is the, is the lesson of Arachne. I'm not sure. But, um, <laughs> hubris. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. That's I maybe the word hubris, I was looking for. Yeah. It's almost uh, always hubris uh, or at least hamartia. Yes. So for anyone who, who listens, who doesn't know, I actually started off uh, making mythology based content. I I was originally a vlogger who retold the stories from Greek mythology in particular, classical mythology is kind of my bag. That's uh, that's where I live. But this is all super, super interesting to me because you do get this interesting thing where they're not necessarily, um, they're not moralistic tales in the way that fairy tales are. Fairy tales, folk Mm. tales, mythology, they're all slightly different uh, genres really, ultimately. I feel for the most part, just, as an additive to that statement, I'll let you continue. Is just that a lot of folk tales come from parents telling their kids not to go die from some unrelated <laughs> thing. So they make up a myth. It's like, look, there's a crazy horse in the water. It's like, no, it's bacteria. But yeah, so there's there's that divide between actual myths and like fairy tales or yeah, warning and, tales. Yeah, and part of that, at least with uh, at least with classical mythology, part of that is that these are stories that were from from popular culture from from just you know everyday sort of uh, oral storytelling culture but the versions that we have access to now are fairly formalized um, mm. versions of yeah. those stories they come from plays they come from epics that we still have records of um, and so so I mean it's always funny to me when people talk about in the original myth it's like we don't know we don't know from the original myth what we know is yeah. from this Roman play that was written about the Greek yeah. story yeah. You know, several even- hundred years later. Um, yeah, like uh, right there, I have like books of uh, Irish myths, Chinese myths, and it's all English translations of these myths by a writer who knows how to tell a good story, whether or not it's accurate. It's absolutely, it absolutely. Good. I always Especially, say that Virgil yeah. was a better writer than than Homer, but I don't know that. I don't read ancient Greek or ancient Roman, so I'm really just saying <laughs> exactly. that whoever yeah. translated Virgil did a good job. Um, exactly but, yeah but no you end up with this interesting thing where um the stories do have a moral bent but it's almost it's got this official layer on top of it right um because we get these stories that say you know heracles was good he was a goodie um and he was good because he you know he broke all these rules that are very important mm. you know the rules of hospitality are paramount within within ancient Greek culture, you know, you can never kill someone who is staying at your home, even if they've wronged you, that sort of a thing. And Heracles broke those rules all the time, but he also, he made up for it. He did the labors, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, but you, yeah. you also get complications to these. You get the, the fact that um, Prometheus, on an official level, he's punished for what he does. He gives fire to humanity. He's punished for that. Mm-hmm. But humanity still knows deep down. They're like, okay, but but his trickery was good for us. So actually we do like Prometheus. And they rewrite the story later on. They say, actually, uh, Zeus freed him later on because Heracles became his best friend. He he wasn't punished for forever. Um, it's a, it's a whole thing. thing. It involves the death of um, huh. Chiron. Anyway, it's, yeah. Um, yeah. And then it gets- oh, Spoilers, poison. Chiron dies? <laughs> I mean, eventually, thank goodness, he was, sta- he was stuck there being poisoned by a Hydra Venom arrow for- a very long time. He wanted to die. He it was, was good chilling. for him. It's, um, oh, what's, th- there's actually a proverb relating to Sisyphus. Uh, I think it literally is just Sisyphus was happy. Uh, 
that's a good proverb. I, I'm sure um, you're familiar with yeah, it. Yeah, and then it, it, it gets even more complicated once you look at even closely related cultures. You look at classical Greek mythology compared to classical Roman mythology. The Romans took a lot of those stories, but you look at the Greek mm-hmm. stories, they They, they Romanized venerate, them, yeah. Yeah, they, so, so the Greeks <laughs> venerate, um, you know, Athena above Ares. A- mm. Any stories that involve Ares, usually he's the butt of the joke. You know, he gets injured and he runs off crying. Yeah. He gets stuck in the, the sex net that Hephaestus made. You know, he's he's the, the butt of the joke. Net. <laughs> they, yeah, they do not I like Ares that. very much. They make fun that. of him. Um, but you move yeah. over to Rome and suddenly Ares they as Mars. War. Mars is like yeah. the yeah. big, the top dog, right? They love him he's because they Dexter. don't... Yeah, they don't care so much about the difference between violent warfare and, you know, um, sort of tactical wisdom warfare yeah. that, that Athena represented. In Rome, they were like, no, we're just kind of about winning the war. So we like Mars. And suddenly mm. the stories change. So, so you see this subtle development over time of what mm. the morality looks like. So these were great examples, and I've loved talking about it. Yeah, no, because oh, I, I think... super cool. You're, you're, you're kind of explaining what I was trying to hint at earlier because I heard, a, um, I think it was Overly Sarcastic Productions do really cool mythology videos and they were hypothesizing, I think, more so than making a statement that perhaps because the Norse mythology, what we know about it was largely written about by a Christian guy, you know, m- many centuries later. Um, yeah. Perhaps, and I'm open to be that. That was a generalization. I'm hoping to be corrected on that. Um, no, no, but no, you're right. Snorri Sturluson. It's it's a whole but, thing. Yeah. That's, but there's <laughs> there's a lady in like the 1700s or something. I bought a Norse book that explores all the Norse mythology, and the the author just says like these stupid guys who didn't know Christ did X and Y. It's like, well, you're yeah, not. Sure. The bias is making. I stop reading the book. It's like that's not. Well, so the, yeah, there is obviously the, a personalization to all these myths yeah, as yeah. they're translated. For sure. Yeah. So so the Sorry. hypothesis that they came up with was, um, you know, did the Norse actually, was Loki seen as, you know, a villain or was he actually seen as a mischievous do-gooder who was kind of teaching a lesson to all the fallible other Norse gods, you know, because if you look, and, and maybe this is our modern like the morality Joker. kind of, being printed down upon it but if you look at the stories of thor thor's an asshole like what does no, he he's do terrible. he goes and he's absolutely hits people awful. with nothing hammers good about constantly thor. Yeah, yeah exactly and it's like did the did the norse look up to him maybe because they liked you know raiding and, yeah. and or a, they liked you know, bashing they, in people with him exactly <laughs> or the warriors or, at least right it's a generalization yeah. or was there you know a lot of this because you know um you know, Thor, there's a, the myth where Thor gets put in a dress and there's the myth of, um, I think it's, I'm going to mispronounce this, Atgar Loki or the, 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 the giant who kind of has competitions and Thor's humiliated in those competitions, um, you know, and so th- there's this running theme of like, did they look up to Thor or was Thor actually almost more the villain and Loki was this you yeah. know, lovable trickster? Um, it's also so, something... Dale. I could listen to you talk about mythology in the sort of paradigm that we're talking about it for hours and hours. You wouldn't happen to have some kind of YouTube channel where I could do (laughs) such a thing, would you? Oh, um, well, maybe if people um, search Dale Kingsmill on the interwebs, they could find a YouTube channel where I've made many, many videos retelling the stories from mythology. I'll, I'll just throw in a really stupid tangent. I've been doing uh, folklore myths on my channel because I got tired of teaching people D&D because I don't know D&D anymore. I haven't played it that much. We went in the opposite uh, directions. The <laughs> yeah, right. I'm I'm having a lot of fun. It's just a parody of retellings of myths. It's it's a lot of fun. It's very comedic. Well, uh, well, that being said, thank you so much for joining us, Logan, uh, and taking time out of your schedule uh, to talk with us on yeah. the Eldritch Lawcast. If you, the listener, the viewer, the person out there um, who has philosophized with us through the last hour, uh, want to keep the conversation going, all our Twitter handles are just below our name, so feel free to reach out and give us your opinion on alignment or philosophy or mythology. Um, we would absolutely love to keep those conversations going. Or... You can, as Jeremy did, uh, email podcast at ghostfiregaming.com, especially if you're listening through iTunes or Spotify or somewhere and you can't see our Twitter handles. Uh, Send us an email there uh, and I will grab a couple of them, read them out, and they will start equally heated debates on the Eldritch Lawcast. Um, I've been Ben Byrne here with James Hake, Dale Kingsmill, and Logan from RuneSmith. Catch you next week, guys. Bye.